Run through the darkness and cut through my foes. Cower in fear of the hunter Leopold. Let's ride. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Steve Rodriguez. I'm your true champion, and today I am bringing y'all my first proper deck profile for the Japanese Card Fight Vanguard Zero server. And boy, oh boy, did I pick a good one for you guys today! In today's video, I'll be showing you guys my current Great Nature Polaris deck profile, as well as um, a game a game with the deck, and I'll discuss the various combos, as well as where I feel like this deck places in the overall Japanese meta. Quick little caveat here about this is that I actually will not be playing the game you guys are going to be seeing today because, well, I don't actually have the deck done that I'm showing off to you guys today. But don't worry, I have found a really clever solution and thankfully I have some amazing people in my life to help me out with this video. But more on that a little bit later. For those that don't know, I actually have a pretty cool experience uh, with Great Nature as I was, I think, the only person ever to win a regionals with great nature uh, back in 2016 i also think it was one of the biggest regionals in vanguard history that i went undefeated at using great nature so i'm kind of like uh one of the most successful people to ever use great nature so hopefully i can show off the deck and give you guys some really good information and tips on how to play with it if you guys are excited for my first proper japanese zero deck profile please be sure to let me know that by leaving a like on this video subscribing to the channel and clicking that bell for notifications so that way you guys know when my videos go live for you i think around like 70 percent of you guys aren't actually subscribed to watch these videos so just know that i post three videos a week all kinds of cover vanguard and vanguard zero content can be found here and if that interests you just know that subscribing is always an option i want to incorporate more uh japanese videos into my content and as i'm slowly growing this japanese account hopefully i'll be able to get more and more decks done for you guys as well as more and more videos so if you guys want to see any specific decks in the japanese meta uh please be sure to let me know down in the comments below but guys i think with all that being said let's go ahead and hop into this deck list all right guys here we are in my deck builder and as i said earlier i don't actually have all the cards for the deck done so there's this little paw print sticker next to it uh showcasing that i I'm using rental cards right now if I wanted to actually use this deck. But you know what? For only having the account for like, what, two and a half weeks, this deck is getting pretty close to finished. I'm only missing five triple rares and like three, four, five double rares. Honestly, that's not that bad. I have zero magnet crocodile, which is just like weird, but like I'll probably get some eventually. But this is the deck, you guys. And don't worry, thanks to my boy Sakuya FM, aka John, a good friend of mine, he actually built this deck for me in his version of Japanese Zero and played some games with it and then gave me some uh, recordings that I could show you guys for gameplay uh, demonstration purposes. So thanks to him, I will be showing you guys a game with this exact deck later on in the video. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about what every card does and kind of how this deck wants to play. So first things first, we have the big boss monster himself, Battler of the Twin Brush Polaris. I, I was lucky enough to pull an SP of this card and boy oh boy is this boy sexy. I love it, that Coca-Cola energy, I can feel it. But if you guys wanna know what his exact skills are, he's the new Great Nature card out of Blue Storm Armada or set seven for uh, JP and his, uh, he has two Vanguard skills. One of them is when this unit attacks a Vanguard, it, it gets power plus 3k until end of turn. That coupled with one of our 7k boosters, Duck Build lets him hit 21k on Vanguard, which is really nice for a multi-attacking deck. Why is it a multi-attacking deck, Steven? Well, here's why, random citizen. His limit break skill, or his main skill, is limit break four. When this unit attacks a vanguard, count plus one to stand one of your rear guards, and that unit gets power plus 4k until end of turn. At the end of that turn, retire that unit. So this is like a multi-attack enabler for Great Nature. So guess what? No more stand triggers in the deck. Before, when we used to run stand triggers so we can get our multi-attacks and use our rear guard's boosted power to try and push for more damage, now we just do it automatically. So the deck can play 9 draw now very comfortably and not really sacrifice any aggression. Also, the removal of the locks engine frees up our grade 2 so we have more room for cool tech cards like the Hamske engine or more Buntas. So that way we can enable limit break and get more pluses uh, throughout the game. Our main back of grade three is the dude you saw in the intro, Schoolyard Hunter Leopold. He's actually just School Hunter Leopold, but I think it's Schoolyard Hunter in uh, V series, whatever. <laughs> His skills are really simple. Uh, Vanguard Rearguard, this used to be Vanguard only in the original game, amazing buff, is when it attacks, you may have one of your other rearguards get power plus 4k until end of turn, and then at the end of that turn, retire that unit. Uh, and then his main limit break skill on Vanguard only is limit break 4, counterblast 1. This is like an axe skill to have one of your rear guards get the following ability into under turn. This is a little bit different than I think uh, the original game. I think the original game, the way it used to work was when the unit was retired, you could counterblast to bring it back. 
However, this happens in the main phase, so you can just counter plus one to give a unit the effect to just come back at the end of the turn. Uh, it's a little bit cooler. Um, it makes the timing of skills a lot more realistic and make more sense because back in the old days, you used to like give all your effects to one unit and then have it die based off of one of them, like Compass Lion, for example. And then at the end of the turn, when it would die, you just brought it back. And because it came back from the drop zone, all the other effects didn't actually proc anymore because they were on the unit that was in the drop zone, not the unit that came back from the drop zone. If that makes sense, hopefully it does. Just know that the timing makes a lot more sense. Just be sure to always use your compass line skill first to retire the unit. And then at the end of the battle, wait until all the other skills proc and then use Leopold to bring it back and then it'll stay on the board forever and nothing will happen. <laughs> Just so you guys know, because timing for great nature used to be one of the biggest like issues with people like you like playing against it or playing with it. I had many an argument back in the day like, oh, no, this is the order that things happen. No, 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 this is the order. The real truth is, since they're all happening at the same time, you can actually pick the order they happen in. And so you can just do what makes the most sense for you. That also creates the most advantage. And thanks to Leopold, it makes it a lot simpler. And finally, our last backup grade three is going to be one of, one of my favorite units, actually, in the history of Great Nature. And the first actual Great Nature deck that I built, uh, Armed Instructor Bison. Uh, this is a really simple card. And because we have automatic restands now through our Vanguard players, you could argue that kangaroo is no longer necessary but you can still play King kangaroo if you want to i'd rather have another grade three potentially that i could ride because this deck has no way to search for grade threes so you want to make sure that if you're stuck on something that isn't magna, magna crocodile you can still do something and bison here has a really cool vanguard skill counter last two to get something 4k and retire at the end of the turn that has not once per turn you can do it as many times as you want um and then his second skill uh kind of makes up for it so it's limb break four whenever a unit is retired due to a skill you can counter charge two so basically this allows you to kind of circumvent this extra cost that you have to gain power so he's a really good consistent card to help you get good numbers in the late game or even in the early game if you don't get to ride polaris or leopold first and then finally we have the 12k attacker magnet crocodile this is just a really nice card to restand by itself because it restands for 16k essentially uh thanks to polaris skill without any other triggers so you can hit really good numbers against 11k vanguards in the late game moving on to our grade twos we got our four compass line who is probably the best grade two in this deck uh, he's an 11k base amazing ride target with the vanguard rearguard skill at the end of the turn pick one of your units to retire this must happen and it's kind of a ultimate enabler that we have he's also another really good card to restand because if you restand him for 15 and you have him being boosted by a 6k like stamp the outer here he actually hits for 21 which again is more magic numbers which is something you really want to have in a multi attack deck having really easy consistent numbers in a multi attack deck to try and play around defensive triggers is really useful if you want to push for damage in the late game or even the mid game Next up is one of the sad, saddest downgrades in the history of downgrades is Binoculus Tiger. This car was a triple rare back in the day. And in this game, he's a rare. Talk about a downgrade. But his skill is still as good as ever. Uh, Vanguard Rearguard, when this unit attacks, give another unit a uh, power plus 4k and then retire it at the end of the turn. It's basically Leopold's effect, but on a grade 2. Really nice card. Helps you get more magic numbers. You can give it to one of your boosters, become 19k. You can give it to a compass line. If you give two procs the compass line, he becomes 19k. If you have him being boosted by a duck build, guess what? That makes 26 on a resand. That's an even better magic number uh, because it hits a trigger and a defensive trigger, uh, which is really nice. So if you're pushing them from three to six, you actually can, which is really cool. Next up, we have three armed instructor Bunta. This is the damage adder for the deck. Really helps with enabling limit break. And with how busted damage adders are in this game, now that they're free and no longer kind of less one. He is just like a super awesome value card that is necessary to have in this deck. You could probably cut down to two if you want to like squeeze in a fourth binoculus or run a different grade two. Um, but frankly, I love Boonta too much to take him out. And finally, for our grade twos, we have Pencil Knight Hamske, who got a serious buff in this game. Uh, well, all the Hamskes did. So now all the Hamskes are free instead of Counter Blast 1. And you can search for two copies of Pencil Knight Hamske instead of just searching for one back in the day. Uh, this is kind of the first skill that you tend to proc. So like... When a card is retired, you can actually choose what procs first, like Duck Bill's effect or like one of these on, on retire effects. You always want to proc the cards that thin your deck more. So that way, if you want to draw random cards, you actually get to have a better chance to draw the cards you want, like PGs or grade threes or better grade twos. So having this ability to deck thin and deck thin two grade twos that are then intercepts is really cool. And people like to complain that he's AK power, but guys, we you know our whole deck gives power to the rear guards it really like their printed power does not matter if you're a little bit good at math you can figure out how to make the numbers work i promise you uh great nature is one of those math decks that if you're really good at quick maths and you can kind of figure out the combos you have in your hand it will really serve you well in the long run uh really quickly before we move on to grade ones i want to talk about something that you guys could play in this deck that i see people play but frankly i don't get it 
Uh, let me actually show you guys here. It's called the Vocal Chicken Recorder Meliota Cat. Those that like whole engine that came out in the new set here. Uh, these guys that like call it the other copies of the cards. First off, the dog, the grade one is like totally bad. Don't play it because it's the worst one because it calls the chicken and the chicken is a grade three. So you're thinning your deck out of a trigger, which is never good. Um, but I will say that there is some merit to having uh, the grade two and the grade three combo. So let me show you guys the chicken here. So the chicken's basic effect is when it's a tie, when, it, when this card's retired, kind of last one to call the cat and the cat's a grade two. So you're basically trading a grade three in your hand for a grade two at the end of the turn. That then allows you to get extra intercepts. I will say that if this skill was a battle phase skill somehow and the timing worked like that and you call the grade two during your battle phase for an extra attack, it would be worlds better. But just having this be like your heal trigger that then gets you an intercept, sure, it's like a filtered way to defend yourself. But honestly, I don't see the point. Like if I want to actually keep my grade twos in play, I'll ride Leopold and Leopold will enable, to, enable me to have more defense via just his limit break skill so why would i re like sacrifice precious grade three room for a card like magna crocodile or even leopold to run this chicken now if you don't have leopold's this is a definite great replacement for him because they basically serve the same purpose in getting more units back to the board because you lost other units so if that's your reasoning for running this combo in this um archetype here that's fine but I don't think it's as good as a straight, like, consistent version of, like, great nature, good stuff. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But it is an option that people play, and I do see people, see people play it, and I want to talk about it. An another thing that I want to talk about, too, is the Lox engine. I still think the Lox engine is really good and powerful, but you have to run such a minute one of it. Like, you have to play, like, three, of three to four of the grade two, and then just four of the grade three, which is fine. Like, I would do that, and that would work just fine. But I, I feel like you're not getting enough bang for your buck anymore. Because now that we already naturally restand, resetting with a crit in the middle of the game for kind of last one just seems so not worth it to me. Plus, to get any actual value out of the like mini ride chain that you're running, you have to like play in a weird way that I don't like doing with Great Nature. I don't like committing my cards to board early unless I get pure value out of them or unless I have to. And because of cards like Compass Lion, sometimes you have to. But if I can manipulate my board and my hand in a way that allows me to kind of conserve everything until I get some good combos off in the late game to win the game, that's what I'd rather do every day of the week because overextending with a deck like this can really be your downfall uh, if you don't really know what you're doing. And I feel like these cards like breed overextension. Like they make you want to overextend uh, because you can draw cards and get more power and rush your opponent. And that's great. But this deck doesn't really need to do that anymore. Like it's so consistent at restanding and giving power and just pushing for damage every single turn that I feel like you don't need that kind of stuff uh, or that kind of level of aggression. So. That's my food for thoughts on like the other things you can play. If you guys want to try them out, I definitely recommend you do it so you can see for yourself if you like playing that way. I just don't personally think it's the best way for me to use Great Nature, and I don't think it's the most consistent. Okay, look, moving on to the grade ones. I think this is the best, most consistent, no questions asked, grade one lineup, and I'll tell you why. Because it's just the best grade ones you can play in the deck, and it's at a good number of all of them. That's what it is, okay? So you have three Coiling Duck Bill, the, the best card in Grey Nature, one of my favorite cards. This is my gift emote on Twitch for a reason. I love this card. In case you guys don't know what Duck Bill does, it has an effect rear guard. When placed during your main phase, one of your other rear guards gets the following ability. Rear guard, when this unit is retired during your end phase, draw a card. So it's basically a one for one. You know, when the, when the unit dies, you draw a card. It's the same effect that we have on Blackboard Parrot here. Uh, which is our starter except he is, has a cost that says move to soul to do the same thing and the reason why an effect like this is good is that it basically takes away the cost of losing the unit that we then give power to and when you combo it with other effects like hamske you can see or like like hamske or even leopold you can seriously plus and or filter your deck which just enables you to kind of make the tempo of the game always favor you like people like to say that great nature is like an aggression deck no 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 it's a tempo based deck the whole point of all your effects is to drive the game state to a place where you're in total control whether that's my deck has no more grade ones in it only triggers or um i can attack you four times every single turn for magic numbers and you've got to try and find a way to survive or I have enough cards in my hand to constantly refill my board despite you getting rid of my rear guards. You know, that's the main selling point of the deck. It's not just, oh, pump dudes and attack. It's a lot more intricate than that. And this card is the main combo adder that the deck has. And I feel like running three of it's a good number uh, where four would kind of subtract from your other good grade ones. 
Uh, really quickly, moving on to Pencil Squire Hamske, which is the same as the Grade 2 Hamske. Rear Guard when retired during your end phase. Search for two copies of Pencil Squire Hamske. Really awesome. Great that it's a free skill. The reason, by the way, that we're playing three of each of these and not four is because three is like the most consistent number where four is too many because that last one your deck can't be searched for. So there's no point in having it in there. And this and having like only two is like not enough to get full value out of the skill. There will be times where you have to ride one or, you know, have it see the damage zone. So you won't get the full proc anyway. But I think that maximizing your other grade twos in your deck is a good like trade off, you know, like though sometimes I won't get two out of my deck, like, is fine compared to maybe not having the third Sea Otter or the third Duckbill, right? Uh, same goes for my grade two here. The third Bunta or the fourth Compass Lion, I think, is more important than the fourth Pencil Knight Hamske. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Uh, but just, you know, the reason why, why we play three in general is so when one happens, we get the other two. And it's basically like we never need to use their effects again. They're all out of the deck now, which is really cool. Playing one of these, sorry, playing three of these is like playing none of these, right? Because your deck officially becomes two cards lighter every time you use one of their skills, which is just super cool for deck thinning. And deck thinning is deck winning. Finally, the other grade one besides the PGs are Stamp Sea Otter. His effect is really easy. This card cannot be retired by card effects. Towards the end of the game, after you proc your, you know, your Pencil Knights and your Hamskays, and your compass lions, you just start giving all your effects to stamp sea otter here. So that way you can just continuously pump cards or pump columns without actually losing any cards. So where Duckbill and Hamsky made it worth it to pump your skills and kind of made you plus actually, uh stamp sea otter here just makes it to where it never hurts you ever. And uh, yeah, guys, other than the four PGs here, which are just standard, that's what the deck does. Um, I really like its placement in the meta right now for set seven JP meta. It's in no way the best deck. Uh, but it's also in no way a bad deck. I think this is definitely top of tier 2 into like 1.5 fringe for sure. Because it can hold its own against decks like MLB, against uh, Aqua Force, which apparently is just everywhere on the ladder right now. I would, I would say like your worst matchup is probably like Narukami because that deck is just so aggressive that it's hard for you to kind of keep up. Plus having your rear guards get bind sometimes really sucks against, um, what's his face, Dungaree. Um, but I would say Vermilion is like just like your like worst enemy because your cards don't get retired. Plus, if you do have any units in play, they just die. Now, being able to play around like losing units by having an empty front row is kind of a cool way to beat that deck. But you do sacrifice all your defense if you do that. So it is a little bit scary. Um, and since we're not playing stands anymore, like it, it's hard to get like gigantic aggression in the late game. Like you can only get consistent aggression, right? I can only realistically make, make my columns 21, 26 if I get a trigger, which is good enough. But if you played stand triggers, you can get two more attacks and make them, you know, uh, die if they're at five damage. So if you want to play stand triggers or even crit triggers, honestly, I, I don't think crits would be terrible. I just don't think they'd be as good as stands. Uh, you can definitely give it a try. I feel like the aggression you gain from stance isn't worth the consistency you lose from the draw triggers. Hopefully that makes sense because you do lose units sometimes. You're like, you'll sacrifice cards and not get any value from them because you didn't draw duck bill or because you're just like sitting there trying to push for damage using one of your grade twos or grade three attackers um so you do lose a lot of your advantage but the deck basically is is in a place right now where it feels like it's very self-sustaining and it's hard to find a deck like that right now in uh vanguard because it feels like every deck is like a combo deck or it's a super aggression deck that just needs to pump everything it has every single turn like gold paladins or even narukami and that can be not that like that, like that can be hard to sustain so this deck looks at those kind of strategies and goes i can do that too but i can sustain myself and that's always a big appealing thing about great nature for me but uh, all right guys that's pretty much it for everything i have to say about the deck right now hopefully you guys did enjoy this deck list go ahead and try it out for yourselves let me know how it does for you down in the comments below but i'm gonna go ahead and load up the vod that my boy Sakuya FM made for me where he uses this deck to play and I'm gonna go ahead and comment on his actual gameplay Maybe talk about some of the things he's doing right and maybe some of the things he's doing wrong I want you guys to keep in mind that I'm in no way belittling his play I'm just trying to showcase you guys all the knowledge or all the things he could be doing with the deck uh, That will help him lead to a victory not trying to say that he's doing things wrong Just saying maybe he could have done something else which might have been better in my opinion but all right, guys, enough dilly dallying. Let's go ahead and watch the gameplay. All right, guys, the first game is going to be against an Oracle Fainting deck. Okay, that's super interesting. Is it Tsukuyomi? Is it Battle Sisters? If it's Battle Sisters, that'd be pretty crazy. I think Battle Sisters is probably a really good, a really hard matchup, actually, because they can defend themselves really well. 
So let's see, he's mulliganing away the hamskays. I would mulligan away both the hamskays and just keep the stamps here. He's keeping the one hamskay. I like, I, I do like it. Ooh, is he? He has an SP Leopold, that's hot. But I do like keeping the one, maybe, so that way you can actually use it if he drew the compass line, which he didn't. He actually gets the other hamskay back into his hand, which is actually pretty nice, as long as you can see another one. It appears that he is fighting against Battle Sisters, so this is super interesting. I think the extra defense they get late game is going to be really hard for us to deal with, but because we get multi-attack, we can swing at their rear guards and then swing at their vanguard, so that means we can kind of mitigate that, especially if they get extra inter intercepts in play. It'll only really become annoying if they call a lot of grade threes that we then have to attack at, because before we wouldn't have had to. Um, but, may but, but we can gain power to get around it, so let's see what happens here. Uh, so he has a really cool turn two play coming up where he can ride compass line, call hamskay, use blackboard to give the hamskay the effect, attack with compass, and then, and then just end his turn to draw one card and filter out, filter out two more cards, which is basically like a pseudo plus three kind of. And he gets the Polaris, so he has full reign of whatever he wants. He, he can actually even be a little aggressive here if he wants to and call down the whole hamskay line and maybe even the binoculars and just like rush damage. I feel that's a little, a little too greedy right now. There's no reason to kind of do more than that. Let's see what John chooses to do. Okay, so this is interesting. He's going to choose to call the... Okay, so I think he wants to go for the more aggressive type play um, and deal some extra damage to his opponent uh, by also doing all the things. Which, you know, it, it's fine uh, because of the way timing works. Uh, if you give power during your boost, let's look at the power boost for the attack. So his, his calm on the right is a 19k. He gets to conserve the hamskane to his hand so that way he can search for more things. So you know what? I kind of like it. It's a little bit too aggressive for my book, but I do respect the play nonetheless. I, I would have called just the grade two hamskay though and then just left that there and kept on the, and the binoculars so that way you could save the binoculars for the next turn he, he's using okay so guys a uh, really cool thing to note here is he is using compass lines effect first that will allow all the other effects and then proc well, while also making sure making sure that you don't lose any more units than you would than you need to and he gets the duck bill off the draw one from blackboard which is a real this hand is looking so perfect he has all the boosters he needs for the rest of the game. He has a great turn to attacker, and he also has Leopold. So you know what? Actually, I think given that he has Leopold in his hand, calling the binoculars is even more okay because he's not actually losing the extra power. He's just really losing the intercept plus the extra power, which honestly is no big deal. So he's gonna have a really explosive turn three too. If only he, if only, if only he was at three damage and, and had a Boonta in his hand, it'd be honestly insane. Um, but I, th I think the easiest play is just to ride Polaris call hamskay call duckbill call both grade one hamskays and then call the leopold this is the turn where you just go ham call the board oh my gosh he gets the compass lion okay so he's gonna do something a little interesting here where he's gonna choose to ride leopold here i'm not a big fan of riding leopold here because it doesn't like i'm gonna ride polaris next turn anyway so like it's no big deal but being able to still get the proc off of compass lion and the extra power without maybe needing to uh commit the grade one hamskays to conserve them for later I don't mind. So he's probably going to swing, you know, compass line to rear guard, um, Leopold to vanguard, give the power to Hamsky and have a 19k column. Super solid. If his, if, 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 if his opponent's vanguard was a 9k, he would have magic numbers against them, which is super solid. Pushing the four. I'm always a big fan of given how busted um, damage adders are in this game, just to, you know, push them to four. It doesn't really matter. They're going to get there anyway, whether I like it or not. So what's the point of me, like, not giving them damage? <laughs> like, like, hey, why push him to four when you can push him to five? And there's the heal trigger. Oof, that's frustrating to see. He was going to do so much damage this turn and get ahead. But now, I will say, if his opponent doesn't have the damage adder, he won't get limit break. So, you know, good sides and bad to both of them. So, with that done, the Hamskay will die. He will get a full proc of both the effects for both the Hamskays, getting both added to his hand, which is just, which is just amazing. Always fun to have that happen. Just a free, just plus all of the all over and then he gets the duck bills effect to draw another card he draws a heal which is a feels bad but his hand went from three cards to what is that three six eight cards which is just ridiculous he's reviewing his deck to see how many grade threes or triggers or grade ones he has left he hasn't seen a single pg yet they're all in his deck and he's officially like out of drawing effects uh which is interesting by the way one thing i want to note too is that i'm not a big fan of his duck bill placement hopefully he can see another one because having a duck bill behind uh, your Polaris is really good. However, given that, that, that his opponent rode Apollon, a 10k Vanguard, it's less impactful. But just know that the best place to put Dugbill is always behind the Vanguard for your Polaris. So that way he, he can hit 21. But given that his opponent's playing a 10k, it's actually not a big deal. It's not going to bite him in the butt or anything. Uh, but it's definitely what I, where I would have put Dugbill. And then I would I would have just called the, the Great One Hamscape for the Hamscape boost. So that way he could still hit a good number against the Vanguard after being boosted once by Leopold. 
Um, j j just because we, you want to make sure that once you get that duck bill, you... Oh, he, oh wait, he, he has another duck bill, Steven. He has another duck bill. He's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> but hopefully he knows to put the duck bill behind the Vanguard and not anywhere else. Granted, again, it doesn't matter given that his opponent is a 10k. He has the Boonta, so he has a lot of options here. Um, I'm, I like him going for the Magnet Crocodile versus calling a great two and losing it. He's going to call Boonta to enable his limit break. I love that. There goes the PG. That's a feels bad. He's going to call the stamp. It doesn't really matter if he calls the stamp or not, but it's okay. Uh, it's a fine commitment to Born. There's the Duckbill behind the Vanguard. Love it, giving the effect to Magnet Crocodile, of course, because that's the card that's going to restand this turn. He's probably going to swing Boonta into Rear Guard, then Magnet Crocodile into Vanguard, and then go Polaris into Vanguard. Restand with the limit break. To re-stand Magnet Crocodile and then just swing again. A really cool thing too about Polaris is that his limit break is kind of always going to happen. If you have four damage, you cannot heal out of it, which is super cool. There's an awesome heal block by the opponent. And this is where the magic numbers start kicking in. You're going to hit 21, so hit over them, activating the effect of Polaris to re-stand Magnet Crocodile, who's now swinging 16 plus 7, which is 23, also hitting magic numbers. If he gets a trigger, he can guarantee hit again. And oh my god, this turn is so stupid. Okay. So another 5k to Magnet Crocodile, the heal of 1, he'll be at 2 damage at the end of this turn, and his opponent will potentially be at 5 or even dead. So let's see. We still hit for a number here, 26, 28 full after the plus 2k. Do they have the PG to guard? They do, they do, so they move on. That's 2 PGs gone, though, that we see because it's 1 damage zone, so this is going to be super cool. 1 PG goes back, we're at 2 damage there, 5 damage. We draw an extra card thanks to Duckbill's effect. And boy, oh boy, are we putting on a clinic right now. We, do, we, we don't have any PGs in our hand. But we're at 2 damage, so we're not in any fear of dying this turn. They have no Battle Sisters in play. There's the Fromage, but is it going to be enough, though? They need to swarm the board this turn and get double intercepts. Otherwise, they are dead next turn. They are straight up dying. We have 4 attacks aimed at their Vanguard. So let's see what they're going to do here. They're going to use Waffle to get the 6k. I think that's the 2k adder or whatever it is. Uh, on place, add 2k to something. There's Macron, and there's... What's that card? I actually can't tell what that card is. Uh, it appears to be some kind of... Is, that's not the damage adder, is it? It could be. I think it's the damage adder for Oracle Think Tank. I forget what that card is, but that could be it. Uh, that's definitely the grade 1 damage adder. I know that. So they have the full board of Battle Sisters, which is good for them. Um, but we're going to attack their rear guards anyway, so they're going to lose that eventually. So it really doesn't matter too much. There goes the draw trigger. Super nice to see. We're still at risk of taking damage. But there's the PG that we wanted, so now we're really safe. Uh, from really any shenanigans here, especially the oop, there's the heal trigger. Dude, the triggers are just flying in this game. It's actually intense. And there's a draw trigger. Like I said, the triggers are flying. This is insane. So unless they like drew like two PGs this turn, we can still push them for game, especially given the way the magic numbers work, which is super nice. Now, John doesn't have a really good. Oh, no, he he has a Polaris in his hand. OK, cool. So he can just call the Polaris on oh, the crack. i draw. It's a little annoying, but it's OK. But it's a good rear guard to attack with, so it's fine. That he drew it here. I would just call the yep, yeah, call the pencil knight there. That's fine. Then call the magnet crocodile over there in front of duck build and just do the same thing we did last turn. Super simple. Swing your rear guards and his rear guards, and then swing with your vanguard and his vanguard to restand your other rear guard that hits for a match number and can guarantee push that six damage if we need it. Super nice. He would have already had it without with or without the magnet crocodile because Polaris is in his hand, so that's super cool. Um, one thing I want to point out to about the deck right now is that it does have a big problem with it. It does not maintain grade twos on board very well which is where like the vocal chicken stuff can kind of come in handy however i will say that if you want like a more defensive type play saving your leopolds for the late game to kind of bring back the grade twos that you kill is probably your best way to get some defense out of the deck in the very very late game however with you know the way this game has been going we haven't really needed much defense at all it's kind of just been like a pure regression show with the deck which is really cool because the deck does have that button of like just swarm the board and deal some damage now, I'm more of a conservative, tempo-based advantage player, and, then, and I, I, I always wait before I just drop my hand to go ham. Um, but I like the way John approached this matchup, actually, because he knew that in the late game, it might be harder to get damage against the Battle Sister deck, so he chose to just do a bunch of damage early and then try and push. So now there's no intercepts in play. As long as we survive this turn, we're not dying. We're at 4 damage. We have a PG in our hand, unless they're playing stand triggers, which we know they're not. Unless they're playing critical triggers, without, which even if they did, we have the PG in our hand. So there's no world where we die at all. There's another draw trigger. That's super hot. And there's another PG into a draw trigger. It didn't actually matter, but it's good to see. Good to see. Unless, look how many cards are in our hand. And look how many cards are in my opponent's hand. And they're the Oracle Think Tank deck. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the crazy thing to see. How much more we have in our hand than they do. That's the power of this deck in terms of allocating its resources. We have six cards within our deck. And I'm pretty sure they're almost all triggers. Uh, so that's a really cool thing. 
being able to thin as much as this deck does is a really powerful thing too. I would I would love to know how many triggers are actually out uh, at this point. But I would just call the players there and maybe call the yes the binoculars is perfect. It, it it hits the 15 which we needed to hit which is great. I would swing the binoculars first, give the power to the Polaris so it can hit by itself unboosted, and then swing their Vanguard Polaris, restand 4k, attack again. Even if they had four PGs in their hand, they would need all four in order to live this turn. And boy, oh boy, that is a decimation right there. Way to go, John. Using the deck that I built to its fullest potential against, I would argue, probably a bad matchup for multi-attack decks. But look what you can do with the power of the furries. I love that game, John. Thank you so much for sending it to me. And thank you again for supporting. By the way, guys, I'm going to go ahead and leave links to my boy John's channel down in the description below. It's called Saki FM Anime Gaming. Definitely go check him out if you haven't already. But anyway, guys, a lot being said, that'll be the end of the video. I really enjoyed doing my first proper deck list video for the Japanese server for Carpet Vanguard Syrup. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and enjoyed what I had to say. This is definitely one of those decks that I feel like I have an expertise on and a lot of success with in the past. So I feel like I know how the deck works. I can give you guys some really good valuable information to take for yourselves if you want to do get better with your great nature plays. If you guys have any questions about anything that I talked about in this video or want to leave your suggestions for decks that I could do for JP in the future, please leave them down in the comments below or better yet, Hop into my Twitch channel. I go live every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in the morning, Pacific Center Time, and I do all kinds of Carpet Vanguard and Vanguard Zero content over there. Feel free to come, hang out, enjoy yourselves, and maybe have some of your questions answered live and in person. Uh, but anywho, guys, with all that being said, as always, I've been your true champion, Steven. Please be sure to work hard, rest easy, live well, stay safe, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.